Saddle up, Maximal Beings, because it's Colon Cancer Awareness Month. You know, colon cancer remains the number three cause of cancer death in America. People are getting it younger and younger. And I really think that a lot of people are getting it younger because of what is happening to our food system. So unpacking the concept of colon cancer today uh, and joining us returning to the podcast is GI Jeff. And of course, my wonderful co-host, Jackie P. I'm Doc Mock. I'm a interventional endoscopist, which is a GI doctor that specializes in cancer biliary disease, and I'm also an integrative functional medicine doctor. And joining me in Philly, Jackie P. Hello, hello, Maximal Beans. It is I, Jackie P., your layman. Um, I took AP Bio once in high school. I did not pass the cumulative <laughs> test. So that is as much science I have in my brain. So I'll keep everyone here, uh, you know, non-clinical and down to earth and, uh, you know, kind of try to keep us on task. And uh, over to you, Jeff. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, I am uh, Jeff Stanzo. I am a gastroenterologist. I'm in private practice. I work out of Eastern Pennsylvania. Um, so I kind of do more general gastroenterology work from endoscopies, colonoscopies, heartburn, irritable bowel syndrome, things like that. I will also say that I'm currently on my commute home from work. So if I sound distracted, you'll know why. But I'm happy to talk about this topic today with you guys. And we're so happy to have you and please drive safely. Um, we, we really <laughs> appreciate your time. Yeah, uh, Doc Mock, last time we did this, it was snowing. So I think I'm in a better spot than I was then. Yeah, and you navigated that. At least that. it's not snowing now. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot supplement your way to health, but there are things that we need to add to our lives that can maximize our pathway to wellness. The American diet is virtually devoid of omega-3 fatty acids, which play a major role in cardiovascular disease gut permeability, and mental health. Personally, I take omega-3s every night and iHerb is the best place for clean, natural sources of supplements. I love the ZenWise Omega-3 Fatty Acid Supplement, which is free of fish burps and good for the environment. Head on over to MaximalBeing.com slash iHerb, that's I-H-E-R-B, and enter the code B as in boy, D as in dog, B as in boy, 5528 and receive 10% off your orders for all supplements. Maximize your supplements with iHerb. Welcome to Maximal Being, a GI doc and ICU nurse that break down the science so you can exceed your gut health, nutrition, and fitness goals. So, let's smash the bro science and optimizing your health with your hosts, Doc Mock and R.N. Graham. Um, so, colon cancer, you know, uh, an interesting thing that a lot of you may not realize is that, um, you know, a couple of years ago, um, our expert societies lowered the age of colon cancer screening uh, to 45 from age 50. Um, and this is because of a study that came out of Memorial Sloan Kettering, where they realized that, you know, people were getting colon cancer at younger and younger ages. And I'm certain that GI Jeff here has um, stories to tell, but we've all seen those people in their 20s, 30s that have colon cancer, even in their teens, if you take care of pediatric patients. And so, you know, I think it's important for you, the listeners, to understand what colon cancer is and what you can do to prevent it, um, you know, holistically and also who to who to go through to when you're when you're having symptoms so over to gi jeff um how do we get colon cancer i know that's a big big question right so well that's a loaded question so let's just start with kind of broad stroke so first of all when we say the word colon that's synonymous with large intestine okay so it's a hollow organ that's approximately 80 centimeters long so on the order of three to four feet long it's at the very end of your digestive tract. The primary job that the colon has is to absorb water and electrolytes from the liquid stool that helps it turn from liquid to solid. Um, what colon cancer is, is sort of a, a progressive growth of the lining of the large intestine uh, that can become cancer essentially, right? So the, you start with sort of a, the normal lining of the colon and then over a series of time, there are changes that happen at the cellular level that'll, that'll force that lining to become cancerous. 
So the purpose of screening for colon cancer is that most often these things grow so slowly that we can identify them when they're still very small and deal with them in a very easy kind of manageable way. Um, what else did you want me to address there, Doc Ma? Because there, there was a lot there to unpack. Yeah, I mean, I think the most common question people ask me when we tell them that they do have colon cancer or the precursor to cancer polyps is how did I get these things? You know, how did they get inside of me? How do you address right. that question? So, you know, th there's, a, there's a certain percentage that have sort of genetic, you know, predisposition to it, right? So they can run in families. These things are not quite as common as just sort of the, the, so, the so-called garden variety polyps, right? So it happens because of things that happen at the cellular level and the DNA and things like that in the cells. The, the question becomes, and I get this often, is am I doing something or not doing something that is making this happen? So we've started to sort of explore the, the link between diet and lifestyle and things like that with the risk of colon cancer. A lot of the times, at least in the past, colon polyps, which again are for the most part considered precancerous, were thought to be sporadic, which means that they just kind of happen randomly. The colon lining divides as part of the normal process. And every time it divides, you have the chance of sort of a precancerous you know, lesion happening. We are starting to notice increased chances of um, these lesions happening with certain dietary changes. And I think Doc Mock will talk about that later. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, well, Jeff, actually, I had a quick question, you know, because um, you said there were a, a variety of, of, of thing, factors, right, that can, you know, lead, right? And, and there, are, there are folks that are, I mean, you know, considered, I guess, they have higher risk factors, right? Um, if I understand correctly, right, the way that the medical can we look at everything, right? It's like, okay, what are the risk factors? These things don't mean you're gonna get cancer or you're gonna, you know, get this illness. It's just these are the things that are um, something that are, uh, that may increase the likelihood, I guess for lack of a better word. Um, so, you know, you said, you touched a little bit on, you know, family history, personal history, um, age, right? Um, are there other, you know, things as far as, you know, eating habits or, um, you know, fitness level or anything uh, that, that might also, you know, be a higher risk factor for colon cancer? So, you know, we've started screening on a routine basis starting at age 45. We say routine because a lot of the times patients will say, well, doc, since I don't have any symptoms, why do I need to get this test in the first place? And the reason is most of the time when these precancerous spots inside your colon are there, you really would not expect to have many symptoms. It's only when you develop symptoms, that's usually a sign that the disease is more advanced and therefore much more difficult to treat. So when we talk about other risk factors, which I assume we're gonna get into, you talk about things like obesity, which has been associated with increased risk of colon cancer. And there are dietary uh, things such as in diets high in red meat, diets high in processed meats, so like deli meats, salami and things like that, um, that has been associated with um, increased risk of colon cancer. Um, and this is, these are things that we're only learning more and more about the, you know, in, in recent memory. Doc Bach, would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. You know, the red meat thing a lot of people will ask me about. And, you know, the, the theoretical mechanism is that the heme compound in a lot of these uh, red meats is uh, induces a, um, a relative inflammatory state, uh, in particular within the intestinal tract while you're trying to digest it. And this inflammatory reaction, um, often due to a compound called NF-kappa-beta, will um, release little compounds uh, within your DNA and damage them, and then also oxidize your DNA. And when your DNA is oxidized, that's when it's more prone to uh, mutating. And when, when something like the colon that turns over every three days has a mutation, it's very prone to that mutation growing and growing over time, albeit slow, um, but it, it's just one of those organs that's very prone to, um, to damage the DNA. Um, now, uh, another thing that, that people ask me on the flip side is what can I do to prevent colon cancer? And so red meat and nitrogen containing compounds like, you know, processed meats bad, but what is good? Well, I think the, the answer to that is, is 
fiber and vegetables, right? Um, and I think that, I, I, Doc Mock, I think you said you were going to talk about more specific um, anti you know, cancer fighting vegetables, but we sort of globally recommend a diet that's higher in, you know, sort of lower in fat, animal protein, and higher in vegetables and fiber uh, as sort of a dietary measure to decrease your chance of, you know, of developing uh, colon cancer. I also want to think, I think it's important to point out the, the fact that these risks are not absolute, okay, they're relative. So it doesn't mean like you're going to sit there and eat leafy green vegetables every day long and you'll never ever get colon cancer. It's all about what you can do to personally minimize your own risk. It's not an absolute. And it also means that people who eat right meat regularly are not destined to get colon cancer. Would you agree? Yeah, I, I totally agree. You know, not, not everybody's microbiome is the same. Not everybody's digestive tract is the same. Um, and so, yes, I think you have to tailor your specific uh, baseline risk and the lifestyle factors that, you know, fit that baseline um, DNA. Back yeah. to Jack B. Thanks, Doc. Um, uh, Jeff, you know, I have a question. You know, you did mention something saying that, you know, uh, in, in colon cancer, right, you s when you see symptoms, right, that means things are you know, more advanced or have more progressed further along. Um, but, you know, what, you know, if, if I am in someone who's, you know, let's say I'm 40 or 45, you know, and, and there may not be hardline symptoms, what would be some things that you at least say, hey, you know what, this isn't normal or typical, maybe you should go take, you know, go see your GI doctor? Right, that, that's a really important question, right? So, um, the question is essentially what would be the symptoms that you'd experience that would land you in the procedure room to get a colonoscopy? The obvious ones would be visible blood in your stool, okay? Anything that would be, you know, and that's one of those things where I never, never like to dismiss it, right? No matter how young the patient is, even if it's on the paper when you clean yourself, right? So blood is essentially always a reason to get a colonoscopy. Any unexplained abdominal pain or unintentional weight loss is definitely a reason to see a doctor in our line of work. Also, any unexplained change in your bowel pattern. By that, I mean, you know, a, a change in frequency or consistency of your stool that you can't otherwise justify by saying, well, I've changed my diet, or maybe I was sick recently, or I took an antibiotic or whatever. So those are the big ones, right? So bleeding, abdominal pain, change in bowel pattern uh, and weight loss. Those are the real reasons why you would want to take a look sooner than the uh, sort of knee-jerk recommendations for screening at age 45. Yeah, I think it's also important to walk through with the listeners that the most common symptom is no symptoms, right? We, all right. the time we're diagnosing colon cancer and that person had no idea at all, no, no family history, maybe even no risk factors and no symptoms. Um, the next question that, you know, a lot of people will ask me, you know, people are so afraid of the thought of a colonoscopy, right? People are weird about things going near their bottom. Um, we're a very bottom obsessed culture. So, you know, GI Jeff, uh, walk the listeners through like, what, what's the process for prepping for a colonoscopy? Is it a big deal? Is it super scary? Right. So this is also a question that I get basically every day, um, the, the thing that I like to lead with is, you know, the procedure is painless, okay? It's done under sedation. The patient is completely asleep, although still breathing on their own. Depending on the person, the average length of the test itself is around 15 to 20 minutes or so. And again, without pain. So the day before, the two important things you have to do, not eat solid foods. So you're relegated to sort of jello and broth and liquids. And then you have to take the laxative purge. And this is what notoriously gives people a lot of issues, right? We split that dose in half, which means that you are not drinking it all in one sitting. That ideally tries to avoid a lot of those symptoms of getting full and nauseated and things like that. So you're drinking half of the prep, then you have a couple of hours reprieve and then drink the other half a little bit later. Yes, you do have to poop a lot. Yes, it is absolutely necessary for the test to be high quality study. But the procedure itself is painless. And, you know, the whole idea is that if you find a polyp during the procedure, you can, most of the time, you can remove it right then and there. Yeah. And, and, and also for the listeners out there, there are few polyps that, you know, 
cannot be removed endoscopically. Um, in my world of therapeutic endoscopy, we problem solve and use special techniques where we can remove, you know, big, big polyps. I mean, we're talking like the size of your fist that we can remove endoscopically without a single scar or incision. Um, about five, 10 years ago, people were getting the part of their colon removed for these polyps. But, you know, due to advances in technology, there's really not much that we can't tackle. I've only met one polyp that, that I can't remove. And the biggest polyp I've ever removed is 20 centimeters. So that's, we're talking like this big. Wow. Um, so, you know, I, I think the, the next question is like, what are the specific things that people can do dietarily or supplement wise to, you know, help with fighting colon cancer? Jackie P, did you have any uh, spe specifics? Um, I do. Um, you know, I'm going to ask about my favorite thing ever, the OMG Omega-3, but we may or may not get to that. But um, I, I know you mentioned earlier or, um, you know, before start that there were specific food, uh, you know, vegetables that kind of helped that had properties that help, you know, had, you know, I don't want to say anti-cancer properties or, but just basically helped your body fight off you know, the growth of these cells. So I just kind of wanted you, you know, to elaborate on that and, you know, maybe help some of the listeners know, you know, what they can eat to kind of help be in their favor. Right. So I think broad strokes, you know, GI Jeff tackled a lot of these, just, you know, ensuring that you get enough vegetables. And by that, we mean probably two to three times what the recommended daily allowance is. So, which is usually around 10 to 15 grams of fiber in a day. Um, I don't know about you guys, but like, I don't think I've eaten as low an amount of fiber per day in, I don't know, 20 years, something like that. Um, I eat more like 50 grams of fiber in a day, um, which I know sounds like a lot, but you know, the gut is amazing. It, it, you can absorb all of that water um, and you can hold on to stool and have a normal functioning bowel with that amount. So microbiome aside, you know, generally having vegetables that are of different colors is really important. Why? Because those different colored vegetables have different compounds within them, what we call phytochemicals. Phytochemicals are things that either challenge your DNA to adapt over time to stressful situations called hormesis, or um, they contain certain compounds within them that have helped to repair or prevent DNA damage. So they scoop up those things that oxidize the DNA. Um, so an example of something that would induce hormesis or make your DNA uh, more protected against damage by resilience is something called sul sulforaphane. Sulforaphane, uh, Jackie P knows, we were talking about in our group text with our clients is something, you know, let me put on, let me adjust my spectacles, but um, you know, adjust my pocket protector but it's, it's present in a lot of brassica um, sort of veggies. So we're talking broccoli, we're talking cauliflower, we're talking Brussels sprouts. On the flip side, you know, different color spectrum, purple uh, fruits tend to contain something called resveratrol, right? A lot of you I'm certain have read about resveratrol um, in our cholesterol podcast, right? When we talked uh, with Hattie Leisha and resveratrol is what, you know, makes red wine, purple, and that is the cancer fighting compound within purple foods. And then there are a lot of berries in particular, like raspberries and blueberries that contain things called anthocyanins. And those anthocyanins help to prevent um, your DNA damage. They scavenge up all those, what we call reactive oxygen species, those breakdown things that oxidize your DNA. So those are some of the big ones in terms of uh, protective effects. But wait, there's more. So uh, what are your guys thought about coffee? I like to drink it. Um, and I think, I think so, um, most studies in terms of uh, the health benefits of coffee, at least I know specifically when it comes to the liver, uh, have been pretty clearly positive. As far as its effect on the gut microbiome and colon cancer risk, I have to be honest, I can't cite you any specific studies, but I can only assume that it's helpful. Jackie P, uh, you start your day off with some coffee? I do. I do. As a intermittent faster and a, uh, a, a bear wolf hybrid chronotype, 
if you don't know what that means, look up what your chronotype is. It's the type of a sleeper you are. Um, I like to, I rummage all night, every night. So I love my coffee in the morning. And uh, yeah, I'd have to agree with Jeff. I don't know specifically uh, how much it helps, but I've only read good things. Unless you're drinking, you know, 20 cups a day, then obviously that would be bad. But um, yeah, I'm saying thumbs up for coffee. Yeah, I mean, you know, just like the other foods that we're talking about, there are compounds within coffee specifically. It's not necessarily the caffeine, right? It's in the actual coffee bean. You need to know where the coffee bean came from. The type of bean um, tends to be more Arabica beans. So we're talking high-end coffee versus, you know, say a lower-end uh, coffee. The preparation doesn't matter. And it's around two cups a day that seems to be the optimal rate. GI Jeff hit the nail on the head as always. Um, liver cancer, it's like hands down really great, but there is a specific study that was published in GMA Oncology where they randomized patients to undergoing chemo with some coffee, two cups a day, or chemo without coffee. And the group that had the coffee actually had less recurrence of stage three colon cancer than the group without. Now, obviously there's more to the story than that. I'm certain if you read the article specifically, but, it, but it's interesting and a very, very benign intervention at that. Let's talk about your favorite, Jackie P. OMG Omega-3. <laughs> I mean, if you're not taking Omegas at this point, like just start today, please. You're not like, listening. You're not like, listening to this podcast. <laughs> <right>? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, it's your, your body's natural defense against all types of inflammation, which is why it's such a multi-system intervention. And, and the, on the flip side, it's almost impossible to get it in the American diet unless you're, you know, eating uh, fresh wild caught fish twice a week, uh, rare farm fit fish that's been treated appropriately and is eaten what it's supposed to. Um, GI Jeff, do you take omega threes or? I currently don't, but I, I, I mean, I go through periods of time where I take supplements and then I just stop for a little while. I'm in a non supplement cycle of my life right now. Gotcha. Just trying to get everything to a diet. I eat a ton of fish. Yeah. Um, yeah. You're probably, probably getting not enough, enough but yeah, I'll have to get back on it. Yeah. I mean, I think that the ideal dose, if you look at the, the studies is anywhere from four to six grams in a day. Um, and anything above six grams, contrary to what you may read out there uh, is no better than the placebo group for most of the studies that were done, but the benefits are countless and cold cancer is yet another one. Um, and that correlates over into things like nuts. Um, again, that there have been studies where they've looked at uh, nut intake or a Mediterranean style diet, and actually the rate of colon, colon and rectal cancer death as high as stage three dropped in people that had higher intakes of omega threes or a Mediterranean style diet as compared to those that did not. The last one to talk about, I think that's interesting is garlic. Um, you know, I, I don't know how you guys prepare your garlic, but you know, there are compounds called alliums in garlic that are uh, cancer preventative. And that, again, the WHO has done a, a trial published in the Journal of Nutrition. It, it's a little older of a study, but um, it did actually block the formation of colon cancer cells, um, both in human and in animal models. Um, the hack there is that if you're cutting up your garlic, you need to let it sit for 10 minutes to allow the allium mace to digest the allium granules. It breaks through the cell wall and then the compound becomes in the active state and then you get your active uh, cancer fighting properties. If you don't let it sit, if you immediately stick it in, you know, in your olive oil, um, it, it doesn't work. Now, what about the bad evidence? What's some bad interventions that uh, you've heard Jackie P to prevent cancer or prevent colon cancer? I'll tell you something. There's two specifically that we've spoken about that I've heard. And I remember, I mean, going back as far as back when I lived in Florida in the early 2010s, one was CBD. It was like, you know, the, you know, it was the miracle, you know, people were using it for everything. It was like the cure-all. And then another, because I want to say before I forget, was the alkaline the pH water. I remember that was like a fad. And I even know it was still around actually back in like 2012 time, 2013. Yeah. And, and, and the thought of it is that, you know, cancer cells kind of generate an acidic environment 
Um, and so, you know, the, you know, we're, we're vi- very dichotomous people, right? We think if A is good, then B is going to be bad. It's, it, cancer is definitely not a linear type biology. So the alkaline has never panned out. And with CBD, you know, maybe CBD has good evidence for cancer related pain, but a lot of CBD contains toxins and other metals within it. And so it can actually interfere with the metabolism of your anti-cancer fighting drugs. GI Jeff, what, what are some things that, uh, yeah, I've definitely, I've never, I've never heard, no, I've never heard anything about alkaline water or CBD. I mean, the only time I've ever heard anybody say anything about alkaline water is when they have certain, you know, disorders of the genital urinary system and bladder, but it, you know, medically speaking, that doesn't really make a ton of sense to me. Uh, and certainly nothing that I would recommend regularly. Um, I haven't had a lot of people kind of ask about, you know, or do anything crazy uh, in terms of trends and stuff. So I just honestly sort of, I generally recommend, you know, the uh, sort of what I had talked about beforehand, the high fiber, high vegetable, low red meat, low processed meat diet. The only is shifting gears mildly the, in, in Doc Mock, I think maybe you'll, you know, uh, agree with this. there was a big study at the VA, the Veterans Administration, looking at certain medical things you could do to prevent the incidence of polyps and cancer. And they they found it in non-steroidal drugs. So things like aspirin or drugs that you would take for arthritis and things like that. And they actually saw a negative association, meaning the people who did take these medications regularly had a lower incidence of colon cancer and precancerous lesions in the colon. Doc Mock, agree? Yeah, and similar things have been found with aspirin. Um, and actually, you know, I think our societies are moving towards even maybe recommending a daily aspirin for people with certain hereditary colon cancer syndromes, like Lynch syndrome and familial adenomatous polyposis or FAP. Um, back to you, Jack P. Uh, I don't want to take this side, but the last three things you just said, familial acroposis, <laughs> I don't know what that is, never heard of it. They're, they're um, both, um, uh, yeah, colon cancer syndrome. Colon cancer, right. okay. I just want to make sure that it's we're, a, it's, you a, know. <laughs> it's a relatively uncommon genetic condition uh, in which you grow hundreds or more polyps in the colon. Um, and the lifetime risk of developing colon cancer approaches 100%. Gotcha. Okay. Thanks for keeping us on the straight and narrow, Jackie P. Listen, you said that I was like, I didn't know if like the connection went bad and I just missed a couple syllables or if that was an actual <laughs> word. Um. <laughs> But, you know, I, I was, you know, kind of on the same trend of, you know, aspirin and things can take over the counter. You know, I always hear a lot also, you know, from, you know, uh, folks up here um, that like to do a lot of, you know, like a lot of vitamins, right? To say, oh, man, you take a lot of uh, vitamin D or you take a lot of, you know, B complex and all the different vitamins. And they say, you know, you, you can't you can't take too much vitamins because anything that's too much goes, you know, you pee it out. Um, you know, what, what would you, you know, you know, what would be your response to that? Like, is that, is there any, anything there or is that just something else that, you know, we all hear and pass along, but doesn't have much truth? Well, I mean, I'll say that, so, you know, you can take too many vitamins, but it's, uh, it's difficult, right? So you can get certain vitamin toxicities, tremendous amounts of vitamin C can give you diarrhea, Vitamin A can be toxic in high amounts. So it's, it's possible to sort of take too much, right? There is some evidence to, you know, obviously these vitamins are, are important, right? My personal medical recommendations for most of my patients are the fact that if you truly eat a, a well-balanced, healthy, nutritious diet, you probably don't need it. Um, it it's just, it, it ultimately winds up being one of those things where it's probably not hurting you, but also may just be kind of wasting your money because you're just peeing and pooping out what your body doesn't need. And if you're, if you're, I mean, obviously the best ideal situation is to get it from the diet. And if you, I mean, really, I, my guess is, Doc Mock, most people who listen to this podcast eat a pretty good diet. So I, I think that the benefit of a multivitamin is likely to be really low. Yeah, I, I think with, you know, I don't believe in the multivitamin, you know, it, it, the levels and the bioavailability and the the quality of the actual vitamins within it are relatively low. You know, we've said it before, I think um, not we're colon cancer with vitamin D, but in general, you know, vitamin D deficiency is rampant um, in particular, if you have no sun. So vitamin D is a good supplement to take. 
I think omega threes absolutely are a good supplement to take. And these are just things that are devoid in our, our diet. There are other things that are hard to get in vegetables due to the, the poor quality of our soil, things like zinc and magnesium. Um, and I think a B vitamin is a good thing to have that anything in excess that you don't need, you will pee out of the B vitamin, but D, B and omega threes that that is like the core to any supplement stack, in my opinion, back to you, Jackie P. Okay. It's good to know, you know, cause my, uh, my acupuncturist is always telling me to buy like, you know, all these super duper duper, uh, vitamins. I'm like, ah, I don't know. Those are expensive, but I'm glad to know that the science backs it as well. So great. All right. Well, listen, uh, we'll be back. I have to take a quick break uh, and uh, we'll be back with Jeff and Doc Mock. What's going on, Maximal Beings? It's Doc Mock here. Many of you are returning to the gym now, but some are not going back. Regardless of what you plan, Rogue has got the right gear to fit your needs. I personally own a barbell set and love it. The black op shorts are sweat resistant and flexible for getting deep in your squats. Head on over to MaximalBeing.com slash Rogue for our referral link. Order three items and they ship for free. And as usual, it's Doc Mock, and I'm here to maximize your pathway to wellness. If you're stuck at home and cannot make it to the grocery store, delivery may be the best way to stay clean and healthy. Instacart is the national leader in the direct-to-home delivery service. With numerous major chains and food from smaller stores, you can get those local veggies sent directly to your doorstep. Head on over to MaximalBeing.com slash Instacart and maximize your nutrition today. And welcome back, Maximal Beans. It is I, your layman, Jackie P, with Doc Mock, our calf-muscled monster, and Jeff on his way home to his bundle of joy. Um, I have some questions for you, Jeff, but I just wanted to make sure if, uh, Doc, if there was anything else before I got into my questions that we needed to touch base upon for colon cancer specifically. No, I, I think we handled the high points. You know, if, if any, anybody that's 45 should go see a healthcare provider, even if you're not having symptoms, there are tests that you can do at home, which are totally fine too. Um, just go get your body checked out, please. The human body is like a car, right? You're not going to just leave your oil unchanged for, you know, 20,000 miles. Just get your oil changed, see a doctor so your, your head gasket doesn't blow. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Since I know nothing about cars or anatomy, that went over my head completely. But <laughs> it's true. Take care of yourself. Prevention is the best medicine always. Um, and make sure that you are doing the checkups that are important. So, Jeff, I have questions for you, three. You may know what they are if you listen to the podcast, you may not, but the first one is, what is your favorite exercise? Oh, wow, loaded question. I would probably, so I, I will like go on a little bit all of a tangent. Exercises. I'm a CrossFit guy. <laughs> yeah, I'm a CrossFit guy, so I do all exercises all day. <laughs> um, or at least every day. I think if you talk to me about the probably the most functional and, you know, an exercise that's has so many different iterations that it's hard to get sick of it. For me, it's the squat. Um, I just think it's, it's functional. It keeps you strong for so many different reasons. And there's a lot of different ways you can do a squat. Um, so that's probably, I would say my favorite in terms of single exercise. Okay. You know, I've, I've actually, per, because of Doc Mock, I think he's been kind of influencing me. The squat has become my favorite as well. I actually, I, you know, I, I, I miss like a good, a nice, good, heavy squat. You know, you kind of get down there, you, you get your form right. So, you know, I, I like that. All right, Jeff, that's an acceptable answer. That's good. I like it. All right, I'm glad it's acceptable. I want to be <laughs> acceptable, Jackie. <laughs> Listen, you're beyond acceptable. You're, you know, you're, you're, you're the man. Um, uh, well, okay. You are too. Oh, thank you. Um, quick question. Second question. Um, what is the craziest diet that you have been on or tried? So the, the answer to the question is there is none. I am a diabetic, so I just eat healthy. The cr I mean, it, crazy is the wrong word for it, but my wife and I did a program where we weighed and measured every single bite of food that we ate for 90 days. And, uh, it was, challenging at first but at the end of the day i was not restricted in what i ate i was just sort of paying extreme attention to the quantity 
And I mean, I lost like 17 pounds. I looked like a GI Joe action figure. Um, it was difficult to sustain just because, you know, weighing and measuring your food is hard, but I've never really gone on one of like a gluten-free or I've never done like AIP or FODMAP. Um, I just try to eat balanced and healthy. That's a boring answer, but that's all I got for you. No, that's a, that's a great answer. This is the only reason it's a great answer is because I did the same thing. I took one of Aaron Graham, shout out Aaron Graham, his, uh, his, his uh, body physique competition. I was like, I'm going to do that. So he get shredded. And then he's like, oh, you got to buy a scale. And I'm like, this is, this sucks. I got shredded, but no, you can't after, after the 90 day point. Yeah. I, I couldn't eat Brussels sprouts for like a year. It was, <laughs> it was tough, but um, no. Yeah. I mean, have you, have you had any patients that have come up to you with any crazy diets? Have you heard anything um, on that you know, regard? The ones that always, the, the ones that always kind of make me scratch my head a little bit are the raw vegans. I mean, I, I get it. I certainly understand the philosophy, but I find the diet to be restrictive. So I had a patient who not only was a raw vegan, but also had legitimate biopsy proven celiac disease, which is, you know, going to remove gluten from your life. And then on top of that, went on the AIP diet, the, uh, the anti-inflammatory diet. So, I mean, basically this person ate like quinoa and, and beans and, and like cashews or something, which is like incredibly, incredibly restrictive. Um, so that's probably the most intense diet combination that I've ever had in a patient. You know, the problem is some of it was necessary. Some of it was not, but you know, what else can you do? And, and you proceeded to tell your patient that cashews are the most inflammatory nut that you can right. eat. And then they couldn't even <laughs> right. eat that I mean, anymore. I, yeah. I, I said, maybe you, if you ate a cheeseburger, you'd feel better. But, I, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, feel, I felt sorry for the person. That's just, you know, just a remarkably restrictive diet with real true pathology there too. So Interesting. That, that is restrict. I, yeah, I, I don't like the restriction. Uh, okay. And third, final question. What is your favorite health book and why? That's a, a tough one. So um, I would probably say two things. Atomic Habits is a good one. Um, and I just read one called the, um, uh, oh God, why am I blanking? It's the, the mind-body microbiome connection. Uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Meyer, Emron Meyer. Um, that was a pretty good one. Um, so those are the two that I probably recommend. Um, that were my favorite, but it's mostly because the the recent one is the most recent book that I've read. <laughs> Not that I'm doing a lot of that these days. <laughs> Did you um, one correct me if I'm wrong, Doc Mock? Is I think that's the second time someone brought that up, right? Yeah, Dr. Susan Case uh, recommended the mind body gut connection. Okay, um, and the and the first one you said was the atomic atomic, atomic habits. habits. The atomic yeah. habits. I don't think I've heard of that one. Yeah, I don't remember off the top of my head. I don't remember who read it, or I'm sorry, who wrote it. But it's just kind of a good like philosophy strategy for kind of overall well-being, lifestyle. You know, you've, you've read it, haven't you, Schaefer? Yeah, it, it's one of those like the four-hour work week. You know that we've we've talked mm. about Jackie P. That you know it's just about yeah. like kind of hacking your your day-to-day, -day, maximizing your time. Nice. Yeah. Uh, I, might have to I don't know why I can't remember the author of it right now, but it'll come to me as soon as we're done. I'm sure. Okay. I mean, that's, that's it for me for questions. Um, I mean, Doc Mock, I mean, you have anything else to add or Jeff, anything else to add? Well, I mean, so I think it's just going back to the, the topic of the, of the podcast, the colon cancer screening. I think that it's, it's really important to know that, you know, this is a, a widely available, pretty straightforward intervention um, that can detect a potentially fatal illness at an early stage. Uh, you know, where we could, you know, legitimately use the word cure, you know, if people are scared for whatever reason, you know, these are details that we troubleshoot in my line of work on a daily basis. So, I mean, this is very straightforward with potential major long-term health benefits. Um, so if there's, you know, if there's any questions or symptoms, docs like me are easy to come by. We do these tests every single day. Uh, and it's really important from a public health standpoint, and also to kind of keep yourself healthy from a maintenance standpoint as well. I also wanted to say out there, if any of you do have colon cancer, you know, it's never good to have cancer, to hear the word cancer. It's, it's probably the worst news that you're going to get, you know, in your life, right? 
But colon cancer is kind of a unique beast in that it does grow so slowly. And, you know, GI Jeff here will tell you too, that even though you're diagnosed with colon cancer, it's not a death sentence at all. I mean, people live for a very long time, even with exceptionally advanced colon cancer and the chance for cure for, you know, not just for treatment, but for cure is very, very high, even in advanced stages. So don't fret, stay positive, keep looking forward and seek help because we are here for you. Do you agree with that GI Jeff? I do. I do that. I mean, this is one of the most common and one of the most important things we do on a daily basis. Yeah. So um, it, it was such a great um, time talking to both of you, you know, Jackie P uh, thanks for keeping us on the straight and narrow. Really appreciate you. Um, you know, Jackie P just moved. He's got young kids and he's busy saving the financial world and GI Jeff, you know, he's, lifting every morning at the CrossFit gym, taking care of a young kid and saving lives out there in the field in Pennsylvania. So I Is that why I'm tired all the time? <laughs> <laughs> probably that just the, a lot, actually. Probably just the kid. That's probably, that's probably yeah, it. Yeah, seriously, right? <laughs> yeah, but thank, thanks to you both for your, you know, your community and camaraderie. And thanks to all of you out there, all of you Maximal Beings, for listening and for your support. If you have any questions, email us at team at maximalbeing.com. No matter how small the question is, you can reach out to us on social media. And if you want a customized fitness, nutrition, or gut health plan, we are here to maximize your health. And as always, I'm Doc Mock here with GI Jeff and Jackie P. And we're here to maximize your health. What's going on, Maximal Beings? Doc Mock here. If you haven't done so already, leave us a comment and hit the subscribe button. Let your friends and family know. That way we can get the word out and continue to bash the bro science.